thanks, Jason, and thanks to everyone in Kansas City for being so welcoming. This has been an amazing. This talk actually is, I've been affectionately referring to it as kind of a pesky talk because there's so much that I wanted to do here, um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, I am I am happy to finally do this. I'm a little nervous though. Um, but before I get started, um, you know, yesterday it dawned on me that where we're at here in this venue reminded me a lot of. Uh, Goldeneye, any Goldeneye players out there? Right, is this the place where they actually uh, base the video game? And oh wait, is that Jeff outside? Uh, fending off uh, some uh, attendees that haven't paid their registration fees? I don't know, it looks kinda like Jeff. But with a gun, it's a little strange. Um, <laughs> so I'm uh, down in LA, I'm, I'm originally from the Bay Area, but I'm down in LA currently at a little tech studio called Science. And Science, to put it simply, uh, we make businesses at Science. Um, and we, we do that by basically creating, acquiring, and then scaling uh, businesses by putting together the best ideas, the best talent, and then financing through our centralized platform. Um, and I uh, work, uh, you know, my area is co-founded by me and five other guys, and my area that uh, I work on is all around brand strategy, uh, and I say that lightly because there isn't heavy brand, but there is some direction on brand. Uh, product design, user experience, uh, all of that kind of stuff, identity. Um, a lot of what uh, Crema uh, Lab here did for this event, which I think they did a fantastic job. Um, in the last 18 months, a small correction, it's actually been 18 companies, not that anyone's counting, uh, Jason. Uh, but but uh, in the last 18 months, we've publicly uh, invested in and launched uh, 18 companies. And here's a few. Um, Essentially, the, the areas and the categories that we're really interested in are where there's real universal problems for real everyday people. You know, no, no time machines or any vanity projects. These are, we are tackling things that we feel, you know, when solved appropriately, are going to make life just a lot better for all of us. Um, so whether it's the areas of pet care or men's, uh, you know, personal grooming, uh, underwear, food, nutrition, health, wellness, uh, fashion, uh, social, those are, those are the areas that we're interested in and, and, and we're expanding and, and kind of getting into more. Um, we've raised uh, in, in 18 months for these companies um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 million uh, for them and we've done that through about uh, 40 investing groups and then um, we are, ourselves have our own money that we've raised and Hearst actually were, they're the latest people that pitched in 30 million. And so we use that you know, for operating and, and uh, keep the lights on and some seed money. Um, Dollar Shave Club, I won't play the video. Has anyone not seen the video? If you haven't seen the Dollar Shave Club video, definitely come and find me and we'll watch it together. I've probably seen it more than anyone else on the planet. Maybe Mike Dubin has seen it more, but I, it never gets old. It's, uh, it's a great business. Um, so yeah, the other thing that I do on the side uh, is I have this business, uh, Los Angeles, remind, downtown Los Angeles reminds me a lot of what's going on here. It's, I think you guys might be a little bit more involved, but it's very raw in downtown Los Angeles. And what you'll find is there's a whole bunch of um, manufacturers, makers, people that cut fabric, leather, uh, do all kinds of amazing things. But a lot of that business has gone uh, to other countries. And so uh, there's so much opportunity down there. And, and you know, it's just because I live down there and I, I couldn't help myself. And I've always kind of dabbled with physical products in addition to digital products. And this was just one that, you know, I, I have all these cords in my backpack at all times, earbuds and USB cables. And so I just thought that it would be a good idea and a very simple way to organize all that stuff by making a taco. Tacos are also big in LA. Um, so that's the cord taco. Uh, the follow up to the cord, and we're giving away cord tacos here at the, at the counter, so hopefully everyone got one. Uh, if not, uh, come and see me. Um, the follow-up to the cord taco this is a prototype of the cordito. Look at the cord wrap, you know, so you can actually stuff all of your you know, earbuds and your USB cables and your plugs and wrap it up. It was almost the cord burrito, but I'm saving that one for something else. Uh, and then this is a product that you may have used. Has anyone uh, used this Venturi? Where you pour wine in, it's supposed to make the wine taste better. This actually wasn't a company of mine. This was. Uh, a guy named Rio Sabaducci, who's the engineer, who was a neighbor of mine when I was down in San Diego, uh, was coming over to my house with this thing on the left that essentially was like this kind of plexi cylinder filled with marbles. And he was pouring wine in and he's like, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta try this wine. And he was doing like the comparison with the two buck chuck, you know, and making it taste better. And I was like, listen, it's a great idea, uh, but the product looks like shit. So 
So I basically uh, helped him de devise a way to, to make it look like something that people would want to like, you know, kind of fit into the culture of their wine where they're spending a lot of money. So that's the Venturi. Um, and it all, you know, all of these things are just really based on really simple sketches and a lot of drinking, actually. Um, two of my kind of most, kind of the, my best projects are my two sons in LA, and I wanted to throw a picture of them in. They might be watching this on uh, the website right now. Uh, that's Jake on the left, who we affectionately refer to as DT, which stands for Dark Thoughts. Um, he just <laughs> comes up with the craziest things. And on one hand, I want to call a therapist, and on the other, I just hug and kiss him to death because he's hilarious. Um, and that's Nick on the right. And Nick, I, I strongly believe, is the next Steve Jobs. Um, I believe this uh, so much so that um, we're starting to dress him like Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> and that's the way he goes to school, and that's where he carries all of his homework. Um, no, this was, this was uh, Dress Like Your Hero Day, uh, but I think he wears it well. He actually called me. I was on my way to Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and he's the one that broke the news to me when Jobs died. And I'll never forget that because he called and he, he, he was in a panic. And he was sad because he, he is a bit of a fanboy, and I mean that nicely. Uh, but he, uh, he called me and he said, you know, who's going to make all the phones, Dad? And I was like, well, they'll, they'll carry on, you know, and it was kind of a sad moment, but yeah, he's really into Apple. Um, so I, uh, just, just to give you kind of an overview of my kind of professional background, um, geography is something that I think is, is interesting because Amy Jo was talking about uh, the, the downtown project in Las Vegas. I myself have, have uh, I was on a blimp tour in my early 20s and I traveled to about 40 different states uh, traveling, uh, covering NASCAR and baseball games and and that was a great way to sort of like expand from the Bay Area where I was born and raised. Um, but this is sort of an overview of my, my professional career. You know, in the early days for me, it was, it was graphic design and digital work in the nonprofit areas in San Francisco. And then I went on to just the biggest companies I could find. I thought that was what you, what you did after you got some experience. So I worked for, you know, Disney, AOL, Tech TV, Intuit. Um, and then I met, uh, when I was at AOL, I met this guy named Mike Jones who, uh, we had acquired his business. He had a business called User Plane. He's from Oregon. And um, I just like kind of like, fell in love with the guy. He was just an amazing entrepreneur, had a great energy, and he was the kind of guy that like I would actually leave my big comfy job and go start like something new with, because it's a bit of a scary leap. And uh, so I did that. We did this company called Savo, which is this kind of content business. And I did my my work, I was commuting, it was a lot of Southwest flights between Oakland and LAX, and I was commuting for about eight months, and I got sort of so exhausted, and I missed my boys and, and everything, that, that I, I got my work done, my year goals done in like eight months, and I emailed him, I'll never forget this, and he, I, I said, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wrapped up, I'm going to head home, it's been great, and uh, he said, wait, I'm, you know, I'm going to go work for MySpace, and he said, would you like to redesign MySpace? And like from a design perspective, the opportunity to redesign MySpace was like huge, right? Because MySpace at the time was like the Exxon Valdez of the web. It was the biggest disaster. And so like to, to sort of have the opportunity and to kind of respectfully approach that kind of responsibility was a, that was a big deal to me. And so that was about the only thing that could keep me in LA. And that was about a two year project that I'll, I'll go into more in a minute. And then science is just all startups and all totally different, the exact opposite of big companies, and we'll, we'll get into that. I have a lot of connections to Kansas City, come to think of it, even though this is my first time really spending time here. One of them is uh, Hallmark. I think Hallmark is just an amazing brand, and I, and I was thinking about their brand, and I was thinking about how people actually take a brand, a good Americana brand like Hallmark, for granted, because they see them in all of the malls, they see all the cards in Target, they kind of it's easy maybe to make fun of it a little bit because of, of you know, there, there might be some cheese there, <laughs> but the reality is um, there's a guy named Gordon McKenzie. You guys have heard of Gordon McKenzie, and you, you've, you've, uh, you've heard of this book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. If not, you absolutely need to buy the book. It's on Amazon. It's cheap. You'll read it by the end of the day. It's a gorgeous book, and it actually restored my faith in creativity in, in the workplace and in, in large companies. It was when I was at Intuit, I was redesigning TurboTax, and I, I, moved, um, I moved down to San Diego. 
I moved a friend of mine down to San Diego, and we had this kind of, this uh-oh moment. It wasn't an aha moment, it was like an uh-oh moment. And it was like, wait a second, are we, are we working on tax software for the rest of our lives? What do we just do? And, and, uh, and it, it was an interesting moment, that's when I discovered this book. But I mean, the hairball, it's a great metaphor. Um, it's, you've probably already read it, but I'm gonna go through it again. It's the bureaucracy that uh, companies create through endless rules, policies, procedures, management layers and practices. Each rule is like a little hair that gets connected or knotted to the other hairs, and the result is a giant hairball. And so Gordon, this book is really all about techniques, not just in design, but anywhere where you're at at a company that requires some level of creativity, and I would argue that that's at every level, um, but it's basically a series of techniques on how to not get caught in that hairball. Don't try to navigate it, don't try to weave your way in and out of it, just stay out here. And, and everything will be fine. <laughs> it's just, it's a hairball. Um, so, one of the things that I had to do when I was here uh, was go to Hallmark and see some of, the, some of his legacy and see how much of that still existed. And so I did that yesterday, um, and it was amazing. Uh, we got there, I went with Rachel Brooks and Caleb. We, we got there kind of late, everyone was kind of closing up, but there was a designer that knew a friend of mine in LA that basically gave us a quick tour. And they, they're doing some amazing stuff there. It was very inspiring. This is an example. I guess they have a ranch where they have uh, sort of off-sites and it's where you, know, you need a little corporate escape and, and you can just go out there and they've got a kiln. You can do ceramics. You can make stuff. This was a guy that didn't realize it, but he's amazing at, at carving wood and making totem poles. Um, and yeah, I just thought that was pretty amazing. Um, so. Very inspired by that, inspired by that book. I discovered that book in about 2003, and I've been recommending it ever since. Um, let's talk about MySpace. So, the MySpace project started around 2009, and I came in when there was a bit of a shift in leadership. Um, the original guy, there, you know, there were some original people that stayed, a lot of the original guys left, um, but I was tasked with coming in and you know, basically figuring out what to do uh, with the offering, figuring out what to do with the design. And it was probably one of the most sophisticated problems that I've ever faced because it wasn't just a redesign of a website. It was an organization that had a lot of uh, kind of invested effort and beliefs and a lot of different opinions. And navigating that, trying to navigate that, I had to go to Gordon's hairball book a lot uh, for about a year. And then, and then the redesign really started like a year into it, and then it, it would, you know, kind of show you some stuff. But essentially, MySpace, the weird thing about MySpace was that they started this, they filled this void on the social side. They enabled people to connect, you know, on the web, which was an amazing thing. They used, uh, because it was in LA, they used music and music events um, as a marketing vehicle to get the word out about MySpace. So thus, it, it also became this sort of marketing, way to market, if you were an artist, it became a way to, you know, get the word out about what you've made, your, your music. And so you remember there was a time when you would type in any band or any song into Google and MySpace would be the first result. That's how people would use it. So you basically, through whether they wanted to or not, that was their brand positioning. They had social and they had this great thing for, for music discovery and for artists to get their music out. So what did they do? They started adding a whole bunch of stuff. They started adding, um, you know, things like uh, horoscopes, restaurant reviews, weather reports. I, I don't need to go on. They, they totally lost sort of focus on what their sort of core was. And so meanwhile, other competition came in and crushed them. They crushed them on the Facebook side, or excuse me, did I say that? They crushed them on the social side. And then they, they, they got crushed because artists, as they diluted the offering, found other ways to market their, uh, their stuff. So it was sophisticated. Uh, There's a lot of different ways that we approached that redesign. One of the, one of the things that I'll show you here is we did uh, a video that was basically a representation of all the, the users sort of post the, the, the relaunch and the redesign. And we used that as a way to get the word out. I'll show it to you now.
My name is Brittany, I'm 22 and I'm from Austin, Texas. The first thing I do in the morning is get on MySpace and I'll check my celebrity gossip and you know just get caught up with what's going on with my friends. I guess you could describe me as being pretty popular. Me and my friends are loving the new MySpace. It is so much better, it's so much cleaner, it's so easy to use, even like a five-year-old could probably use it. And one thing I love, now I have three separate profiles. I have one that's like my church profile, I call it. Then I have a page, <laughs> boy profile. It's mostly just my pictures that are really good. Hi, my name's Danny. I'm from Orange County, 27 years old. I play drums in a band called The Hands. I guess you could say I'm kind of like the CEO of the band, you know, do, do a lot with like marketing, a lot of like online stuff. The new MySpace is incredible. I mean, you go wherever you want and the music stays. I, I update my, my MySpace and conveniently it sends it off to Facebook, it sends it off to Twitter. And so it's just like the central hub. We actually launched a new music video on MySpace and people would just ask us questions and we can respond to them in real time. So it's back and forth, like very personal. I'm Finn, 25, from Los Angeles, California, and I'm a graphic designer. Okay. Okay, if I'm not online, something is wrong. You gotta say, I was a hater. I mean, it took a lot to get me back to using MySpace again, but they did it. Bump Facebook, I'm going back to MySpace, and it's seriously, seriously dope. Every single application, the grab bag feature, ooh, you can click something that you're really interested in, and you wanna, don't have time to look at it right now, you can go back and look at it later when you do have the time, but the discovery, it's finding stuff that I like, my friends like, what I'm into, I mean, it's like you're reading my mind, dude. I love the way MySpace is flowing with the iPad too. Oh, got a status message. Hey, what's up? My name is Sean. I'm 23. I'm from Miami. Hey, mommy. Hi. Sorry, I've got like new pictures of a MySpace. They be pulling the ladies. Actually, I got two girlfriends right now. Uh, I put a lot of time into my original MySpace profile. You know, pimped that out. And and when they went and changed on me, I was like, Yo, what is this? But you know, actually, it's pretty dope. Like, I'm pretty much the master of uh, DJ TS, though. Whatever. I've even got tracks up there that like no one's ever heard before. So like, you have to come to my profile to hear that. So. Um, my name is Gypsy, and I am a bartender extraordinaire at the Down and Out. Yeah, no, I moved out here because I wanted to go where all stars go to shine, so here I am. I have a lot of personality. I definitely have used MySpace for social networking when I'm out, like, you know, promoting. MySpace looks crisper, fine-tuned. It looks friendlier. Yeah, it's like a little presentation of, of me. It's my profile. It's... This is what makes Gypsy work. <laughs> I don't know. So, that was a tool. It was really rough. It was a rough environment. It was a rough environment to sell these ideas and try to kind of rationalize where their users were at, where their business was at. So, you know, we obviously had a lot of opinions that we were working with, so we were trying to be inclusive, but at the same time, we were trying to, to get something done that wasn't sort of this crazy beast. So we did believe, though, that there was still an opportunity around social and self-expression um, and music discovery and, and being creative and individualist, uh, individuals and unique. Um, and so we used the video as a tool to sort of see if it was genuine, to see if we were right, to show it to the internal people. Um, that was maybe you know, two and a half years ago. It was like a kind of a forward-thinking video. We hired actors. Um, so yeah. It, that was an interesting project. So it, it uh, ouch, sorry. Yeah, so basically, we, through all of that work, what we realized through a lot of customer research was that people were still using MySpace to find new music. MySpace had the best deal in music. You know, they, they, they had this deal with the labels. It was like unlimited playback, uh, on-demand music, and while other services were coming out and having you pay for it. People were just a little too embarrassed to go to MySpace for that music. Uh, so, you know, in the end, it was a lot of work, and I kind of felt like they needed to focus on the music, maybe try a different name, because I really do think they had an identity problem. And we developed something that, that was under a completely different name that tested really high and was, it was really pretty cool. But then Fox sold it to specific media. I found out that I lost my job to Justin Timberlake. Uh, he became the new creative director. <laughs> and. Uh, I went to science. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great project and definitely one that I could go on and on about. Um, if you're interested, talk, you can talk to me later. Um, so 
Let's go to science now. So the way science works is the kind of first kind of dubious thing that I that I am responsible for is I need to tell founders when when people come in with businesses, I'm the one that has to kind of tell them that their baby is ugly, uh, and, and and I do that very politely, and then I politely say let's you know, work on changing it, and then I try to inspire them. Um, but yeah, I mean Dollar Shave Club. Um, here's the beautiful thing is that like Mike Dubin on Dollar Shave Club, while his stuff originally didn't look the best. That guy had such strong conviction and such a strong point of view on what he wanted that brand to be. And while he didn't have the technical skills to sit down and, and visualize that, um, he definitely was able to articulate it. He could definitely let you know when it was right or wrong. And without that kind of conviction, um, it, it would have never turned out the way that it did. Oh, by the way, the designer that worked on Dollar Shave Club is from a town around here called Hutch, Hutchinson. She worked at Hallmark. Her name is Amanda Hallbrook. Amazing. I've worked with her since uh, 2009 uh, in LA, and uh, great talent. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I have to work with founders on kind of redesigning their stuff. It's fun. Um, the one thing, though, that isn't so fun is when I met a guy last night named Thad, who's um, with, uh, is it Open Air? Uh, he's, he has this thing called Black Ops Development, and I was pretty inspired by him. Um, it, it's kind of this, this idea that, you know, his de development team kind of goes in, kind of middle of the night, does their mission, and kind of out, and in the morning, you've got Bin Laden in a body bag, or beautiful product, or, or both. Uh, but, but it sounds like he has a really cool approach, and actually, I like that approach to design. Um, you know, of course, we have to be more inclusive because obviously these are companies that we're, we're very pro founders, we're very pro CEOs, we work um, directly with them. But one thing that people get caught in is in that early stage, they spend too much time, you know, trying to perfect it and get it absolutely right. And the reality is, is that it's going to change. There really isn't a business that we've started that, like, the whole thing hasn't changed. The names change, the business models change. Um, Everything changes, so it actually makes more sense to just very quickly get something that is um, somewhat usable, somewhat testable, you know, whether it's held together with duct tape, spit. I've already hired a few people here in Kansas City. We're working on a prototype. Nathan's uh, doing a photo shoot later for a, a test project. I mean, it's just really important to move quick because, by the way, there are other people that are trying to outsmart you and coming up with probably better ways of doing it, and they will beat you. So, um, and, and, and the change, that happens when you're attached is it hurts. And it, you know, it's really sad sometimes when people have given such amazing thought to things, but when they come in and, and, and we take a look at the business and we test and, we, and, and it's not, it doesn't quite turn out the way they want, we, we absolutely, that's what we do is we work with them to get it right, but there are some things that, ch that have to change. So we really admire people that can, can be open to being wrong and, and then can jump into the next thing very quickly. Um, it's really important. Th this this one here, uh, you know, figure out what you want to be and then do everything you can to stick with it. I mean, it doesn't only apply to your product. It's really important to have a point of view on what your product is, but it's also, I think, important professionally. Um, you know, the people. So we have a business called Dog Vacay. Have you guys heard of Dog Vacay? Um, Dog Vacay is basically a service where you can find pet sitters, you know, real pet people at real homes. So if you're traveling, you, you need someone to take care of your dog. So Aaron and Kareen uh, Hirshhorn, they were, uh, th they were living with a bunch of dogs. That's how they supported themselves. I mean, they had a house full of dogs. And they were real dog people and real entrepreneurs. And they knew exactly what they wanted to be. They came in just like Dubin with a super strong point of view on exactly what their business was. They were open to the, the brand positioning side, how to tell that story what the logo was, all of that kind of stuff. But at its core, it was all about them and their business. And, and um, so it's really important that you spend some time. And if, if you feel like you're, you're vacillating, you're wandering around a whole bunch of ideas, you're not quite sure, maybe you're passionate about a whole bunch of things, um, well, that, you know, that, that's a great opportunity to just sort of start testing out some of those ideas. But make sure that you have some conviction around something. Um, so, I'm really convinced that design, um, people that are responsible for doing things that are creative, um, they're like rice, and they soak up the flavor around them. So if you've got people working in sort of beige cubicles, 
um, and, and in environments that maybe aren't as inspiring as they should be, your product and the results have a direct correlation to that. And you might just be open, open up to, if you haven't already done so, giving these people the ability to sort of, you know, move into the space, own the space, make it a fun environment. This is uh, Refinery29, a highly coveted place to work in New York. And you can see with, with all of this kind of creativity around, um, they, you know, stuff that comes out of them from the offering side absolutely has to be great and creative. This is a, a picture of my desk. I don't know if you can tell, but our office in LA is optimized for what else? Productivity. So just about everything in the office you can write on, including my, the desks, they're all whiteboard desks, and you can get them for about 250, I think, or 300 at West Elm. They're called, the, I think it's called the Pars, Parsons desk. Um, but environment, space, all of that stuff, again, super important. Keep that stuff fresh, keep it creative. Um, go to Hallmark, that, that'll inspire you. Um, this is an important one as well. I, I think that um, it's really, really important to kind of understand what you're trying to achieve, not only from a business perspective. I'm sure you've all been in meetings where you're communicating to designers, illustrators, photographers, vi videographers, what the business goals are. Um, it's also important to have an understanding of what kind of emotional response. What do you want people to feel? Um, I worked at uh, TurboTax. It was a great, uh, another great design problem they had. They basically, TurboTax has this interesting problem, or they had at least, where they lose about 70% of their uh, first and second year uh, users. And the reason that they lose them is because uh, TurboTax is very complex. It, it's like an 8,000, anyone doing their taxes right now on TurboTax? It's, it's like the mother of all wizards. And you're asked questions like, you know, do you, have you earned any inmate income? Do you own farmland? Uh, which might be appropriate in the Midwest. Um, just a, a whole, you know, whole series of things that are too complex for college students and people that are actually familiar with the 1040 forms, whatever the government provides. Um, so one of their big issues from an emotional response level was that they wanted people to feel comfortable. They wanted people to feel like if they used TurboTax, they would actually give them the, the accurate results. People are afraid of being arrested for you know, submitting the wrong thing. And, and, they, and trust was a big deal. So at the time, um, it was about a year after I had Jake, and I, I was trying out TurboTax for the first time. And on about screen eight, it asked me if I had any, any dependents. And I entered Jake's birthday, which was the year prior. And then it asked for their social, secu social security numbers. And I didn't have those memorized, but I just figured that I could come back and fill those in later. So when I hit submit, the next screen, it literally had like a, like a graphic that was clapping hands. It was like, congratulations on your newborn son, Jake. It looks, it's great. And then it said, we noticed that you didn't fill in the social security number. Did Jake die? And it, and it had a, it literally had like a yes and a no button if Jake died on screen eight. Like, well, I, there you go. Like, and that was the beginning of an 8,000 screen wizard of all kinds of fun stuff. So the point is, is that Know what, what it is that you're trying, what, know what that emotion is that you're trying to evoke and do everything you can to adhere to that. Um, you can also use uh, really good product people, designers, cre anyone creative. And I think actually people are way more creative. You don't have to be a designer to be creative. I think people are way more creative than they give themselves credit for. But use them as therapists. Use them as sounding boards, because if you don't know what emotion you're trying to evoke, you don't know maybe quite what the possibilities are around, around the business goals, use them as therapists, you know, like talk to them, and they'll help you suss that out. So I think that for us at Science, um, you know, we're inspired. There's a lot going on, um, and we, like, like I said earlier, we like to tackle problems that basically make life better. Um, but I think that we also like it, we like to push it. We like to be very disruptive. Um, so I think that just when you feel like you've figured out what the problem is that you want to solve, and just when you get excited about a couple of different ways to solve the problem, challenge yourself. Just take a, a few minutes more and push yourself to think about it in, in different ways. And push it in ways that you haven't seen before. Uh, yesterday I was checking out Scott's charity water site, and I love that 100% model. You know, it's something that 
Listen, it, it might be out there. This might be a pervasive thing, but it's not something that I've seen before. But it made me feel good about you know, donating my birthday. And it's little things like that that actually become sort of tipping points for people to actually you know, invest money, spend money, invest their time in whatever it is you're doing. So I so really want to encourage you to, to be unique and to, and to push it. Um, so I was talking about geography. I've been between NorCal, SoCal, the whole thing. My hometown is California. It's a bit of a blur. Like, I'm all over the place. Um, I have a lot of respect for all the disruptive stuff that's happening, downtown project, Las Vegas. Here, it's so raw. You know, for Jeff and Reagan and the whole crew to connect the dots in, in the Midwest, I think, is amazing. I see a lot of people that are drafting off of Silicon Valley with Silicon Beach, Silicon Prairie, Silicon Alley. And I think that's great. I, I don't think that, like, it's worth a conversation of, like, is it better here? Is it better there? There is amazing raw talent everywhere. And I wanted to share this video with you. Um, and notice the use of the word London. There are no grand celebrations here. No speeches, no bright lights. But there are great athletes. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is reserved for the chosen few, for the superstar. The truth is, greatness is for all of us. This is not about lowering expectations. It's about raising them for every last one of us. Because greatness is not in one special place. And it is not in one special person. Greatness is wherever somebody is trying to find it. So you guys should be really excited about what's going on here. And I can tell you already are but from the people that I've met. There's a lot of passion, a lot of care. Um, I'm inspired. Um, and, and we're inspired at, at, at science. I almost said MySpace. We're inspired at science, which hopefully makes us inspiring. Um, we're really inspired by people that can let go of their ego. And we're inspired by people that can um, you know, go for um, the sort of unsafe route, even though there's harder work there. Go for um, the unexpected, um, be open to being wrong. Um, we're inspired by people that can recognize their coworkers and their teams for working super hard. It's important to do that. Um, we, we're really inspired by people that have endurance, that are disciplined, and really are, that are unfazed for when it's not right. and can just very quickly jump into the next thing, get their hands dirty, be super pumped and motivated to do great things. And when it comes down to it, we're just really inspired by people that are, that are hardworking and inspiring. And I'm inspired, and thank you again for being so welcoming. Appreciate it. <laughs>